Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Michael Bracey with the Music Policy Forum, and I am thrilled to welcome you to another edition of Music Policy Forum Live, our weekly conversation show, where we talk about music and public policy and, and nonprofit activism and organizing and uh, everything that we can and should be doing and need to be doing to try to uh, create stronger, more resilient and more equitable music ecosystems. Uh, as always, we are absolutely thrilled and honored that you're spending some of your Friday with us. We have a, a really, really fun show today. We're really proud of. Um, today, we're, we're gonna break up our typical format for those of you um, who are with us every week. We're gonna do the show a little bit differently today. We're gonna make this a little bit more of a town hall type conversation and, and, and kind of see how it goes. Um, but today we're focusing on our REVS initiative, the Reopen Every Venue Safely project that Music Policy Forum launched last year. And uh, today we're gonna talk about where we are with that initiative, where we're going. Uh, we're gonna hear from a lot of the individuals who are helping uh, us think about and helping us activate that work and, and uh, a lot of our pilot leaders. So it's gonna be really, really fun. Uh, before we get into the meat of the, of the show, uh, a couple pieces of housekeeping and, and we have a surprise guest. Um, I appreciate that a lot of you already um, are introducing yourselves in the chat. Don't feel obligated, but if you would like to let people know who you are and where you're from, it's always fun for, um, for everybody to see who's there. Uh, secondly, um, if you have questions uh, throughout the uh, session, uh, you can always use the Q&A uh, window. Um, and I'll explain this again later as we get into the meat of the show. Um, but we are going to be encouraging uh, folks who are part of REVS pilots who would like to uh, contribute to use the raise hand uh, function. And we're gonna bring you into the conversation a little bit later as we kind of go through the process today. So today is super fun, but before we get into um, the, uh, the kind of formal part of the program, I wanna bring in um, Kate Becker, uh, who's on the road today and is wearing a mask and looks very mysterious, but Kate, of course, is a co-founder and, and a board member at Music Policy Forum and has been a key driver of everything that we do. And in many ways, Kate is the inspiration uh, behind the REVS initiative. And I, we, we, we've asked Shannon Wells from Seattle to join us. Shannon, many of you know, has been a, a leading member of that music community for a long time and is part of a, a, a pretty remarkable network, uh, informal network of collaborators and friends and partners that have been doing great work for many, many, many years but have really been in particular doing some pretty amazing things over the last month or two. And, you know, I know Shannon, you would never ever take credit for everything that's happening in Seattle or say this is the Shannon Wells show, but we did ask you to, to join us and talk a little bit about some of this stuff. So Kate, at, at the outset, do you mind introducing Shannon and just talking a little bit about some of the cool things that have been happening that could really be useful models for a lot of our other cities that are, are trying to do this work? Sure. Thank you for your kind words, Michael. And forgive me, everyone, for having to wear a mask. I'm in a public space right now, so it's a necessity. But happy to be here with you all. And it is truly my honor to introduce you to Wells, who is one of the most noble volunteers I have ever known. And I have known a lot of volunteers. But this woman is an activist, and she is so committed to our music ecosystem here. I first met her. Um, or got to know her well while she was leading a charge to save the Showbox, one of our most iconic venues here in Seattle. Still has not been saved, but of course we had a pandemic come on the heels of trying to save the Showbox. And uh, Shannon has just shifted her gears to be responsive to the need that is everywhere, particularly around our music community. And I'm especially appreciative of her work on behalf of music workers. There are lots of us working on behalf of venues and there's always focus on our musicians, but Shannon continues to highlight that uh, it is the music workers who are also in jeopardy here that we need to be focused on. And so with that, I'd love to introduce you to the fabulous Shannon Wells. And Shannon, let's have a little conversation about the work that you've been doing. Thank you, Kate. That was a great introduction. Um, oh. I think we're going to talk about the Keep Music Live uh, live stream last night. 
Well, I'd love to talk with you about that. I neglected to mention that Shannon is the assistant GM at the show box. Um, so that is her job when her job is available to her. But during this time that she has been unable to, to work, she has been leading lots of volunteer work, including last night's Keep Music Live session. But Shannon, could we talk a little bit about your food initiative for music workers? Would you mind talking about that? Because that was really a fabulous effort that you were the primary driver of. And uh, can you speak to that for a bit? What did you do and why did you do it? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I've worked at the Showbox for 19 years now. And I mean, the place is my home and the people are my family. And so we've been out of work for a year. And um, I know that people are struggling. And so people would contact me and say, what can I do to help? So the first one was G Love. He wanted to do a live stream and take donations and send it to the Showbox staff because he plays the Showbox every year. So that was the first uh, inspiration to get the, um, to start doing food drives basically. So we've been raising money by people in the community who do projects and sell things and send me money. <laughs> <laughs> and then I buy food for the staff. So we've done, um, a, there was a poster designer who did a Save the Showbox poster. And then we did a ticket mask with old Showbox tickets. Um, and we sold the mask. And so I've just been gathering the money from the donations in the community. And then we um, bought a bunch of food from uh, like um, our I'm blanking on the like restaurant supply stores, you know, so we bought in bulk basically and um, broke the food up into smaller packages and delivered to the staff. So we've done that twice now and it's been really successful and our employees are sharing recipes and uh, photos of the stuff that they've cooked and they feel really loved. So that's been really great to do something for them during this time. That is wonderful. And uh, speaking of feeling loved, Let's talk a bit about Keep Music Live and Band Together Washington, the big event that happened last night. You and I both had the, the honor and the responsibility of serving on that team since it started. So um, can you tell our audience a bit about last night's Band Together Washington and the Keep Music Live initiative? Yeah, so Keep Music Live is a philanthropic campaign to raise money for independent venues in Washington State. And uh, we've been together, I think we started working like in May last year. And um, last night was the culmination of nine months of work to put together this live stream that had archived performances from Foo Fighters and Pearl Jam and Macklemore, plus a more recent performance from Brandy Carlisle. And then we also had some live music from Trace Leches from the Central Saloon. And we had both recorded testimonials from, you know, huge stars like Matt Cameron and Kim Thiel. And, and then we had some live conversation with Kathleen Hanna and Nico Case. So it really was a community conversation about why uh, live music is important and these special venues in Washington state and how it's changed people's lives. So it was a great night of lots of music love. <laughs> Yes, uh, our hosts were Sir Mix-a-Lot and Rachel Flotart, who used to front a band called Bisqueen, but they managed to keep everyone entertained throughout the evening. And I have not heard the numbers of how financially successful it was, but I did see Susan Silver throw in a $5,000 um, donation, and then Sir Mix-a-Lot matched it. He's been so fantastic that way. He's very generous. I think he has been our biggest and most frequent donor. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's really great. Yeah, I haven't seen the numbers either. I I did see that fifteen thousand over fifteen thousand views on YouTube so far, and um, so I think it was a huge night. And we got um, I'm sure we got a lot of donations. And I, I would say that as we've seen throughout the campaign, that the music fans are our biggest donors. Uh, they are really stepping up. They love live music and. They're, they're our most frequent and our biggest donors. So we cannot wait to get back to live music. That's awesome. So Alex put the link to uh, Keep Music Live Washington in the chat. And, you know, really, Shannon, thank you so much for, for you know, just popping in at the front end of this because, you know, what we hear from this Rev's work, again, is it's community-based work. And, and as we, you know, both have our existing cohort from 2020 and the additional cities that are joining in, people are just eager to learn from each other and, and look at models at work and, and be able to talk to each other and figure out who's doing what and how it can be applied to their circumstances. So it's, it's been so great for you and, and the rest of the Seattle community to be so engaged in, in the Rev's work. And we'll be talking more about that with Dina in a few minutes, but 
We're just happy you're able to join us at the front end to do a victory lap on behalf of a lot of folks who put a lot of work into this stuff. Um, thanks for having me. Yep, great to see you, Shannon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank so, you, Shannon. And thanks, Kate. We'll hopefully see you a little bit later as well. Um, we do have some breaking news and had tip to Curtis Monroe for tipping us off on this. Um, the SBA has opened up a portal, uh, a new online uh, resource center uh, for the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant. Um, and they now have a date when they're gonna be accepting uh, applications, which I believe is April 8th. So that is not your invitation for everybody to leave the show and get your grant written, but uh, so, so, so table that for later this afternoon. But we're excited that we are seeing the progress that we had hoped for and anticipated uh, in terms of getting that, that proposal, uh, getting that, that platform out the door. So. So with that, we're gonna move into our Revs Town Hall. And uh, again, we are just really, really excited uh, for this conversation. We're excited that you're with us. Um, as uh, we, we uh, like to joke about, everybody loves a PowerPoint, especially those of us here in Washington, DC. And, and so we're actually gonna run through a little bit of an informal presentation to kind of update everybody on where we are with REVS and where we're going and what to look for and why we're doing it and what we're hoping to accomplish. So I'm gonna share my screen and then we're gonna open up the conversation uh, from that point on. So, um, I, you know, those of you who've been participating in this program know exactly what we're talking about with REVS. Those of you who are new to our work, um, you'll catch up pretty quickly. Um, you know, hopefully this presentation and this conversation is something that could be sent um, to lots of folks uh, when we put it up on the website next week, um, just as a real quick orientation into what we're doing and why we're doing it and how people can intersect in it. So again, if you think about what is the, the mission and the vision, why are we doing this? Um, this is a little bit of a revision of what we, what we started off with last year. Again, we started REVS in April of 2020 when there was a great amount of uncertainty about everything. And now there's some things that we can be pretty certain about. We know live music is reopening. And we also know that as people who care deeply about music and fit into different places in the community, we can't be passive about it. We can't sit back and just kind of wait for things to happen. We have to know when are we going to reopen? What is reopening going to look like? Um, what does it mean to have meaningful collaboration? How do we pull together venues, public health, government, musician, workers, audiences? And how do we talk about this and engage your key stakeholders, which we define as musicians, music workers, and audiences? How do we play offense? What does that look like? So as we kind of take that mission and, and move into uh, activating that this year, we have these kind of six core goals. So again, we want to continue the support of our 2020 pilots. We want to revise and expand our national leadership team to bring some extra perspectives and, and, and vision into our group. We want to have a more concrete staffing and outreach plan so we have some, some certainty and clarity about what exactly the REVS work is. We want to invite a new group of cities to join in as pilots we want to uh, share information and resources with all levels of government. We'll be talking a lot about that part today. And again, we want to be doing this public and stakeholder education and outreach campaign this spring and summer, because as we always say, REVS at one level is about the work that's happening with hundreds of people across these 17 pilots. But really it's about how does that information get translated and shared because everybody has to do this work and people who are not involved in a REVS pilot still have to reopen as quickly and safely as possible when the time is right and they have to communicate about it. So we really wanna be thinking about how do we share the findings and, and, and the energy and, and the activities of our REVS pilots more widely. So we're thrilled to roll out and announce our 2021 leadership team. Uh, again, uh, half of the group are Music Policy Forum board members. Uh, again, me from Washington, DC, Kate Becker from Seattle, Hakeem Bellamy, who's a deputy in the Cultural Service Department in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Anna Chalenza from Georgetown University, Ashley Keaton from the Ella Project in New Orleans. Um, then we're thrilled that we've added Sean Lynch and Curtis Monroe, and we'll hear from, hear from Curtis in a few minutes. They are the co-chairs of NEVA's National Reopening Task Force. So we're solidifying our alignment with NEVA and looking to coordinate with them. Again, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes with Curtis. Uh, Dina Morris has is, is joined our national leadership team. She'll be joining us in the, in the program in a few minutes as well. Dina is a public policy expert with extensive history in the United States Senate and at the Centers for Disease Control and has been the co-lead of the Seattle and King County Rubs pilot for the last year. Cole Williams is with us today. We'll hear from Cole in a little bit. She is a community activist and artist uh, based out of New Orleans and Zach Schwartz. Many of you know from Zach's uh, life as a rock and roller through the band Rogue Wave. 
He also is a messaging and communications expert who has been bringing a lot of uh, leadership as a kind of thought partner as we think about our communication strategies. So again, the goal of expanding and revising the, the leadership team is that we need more ideas. We need fresh ideas. We need different perspectives. And we're excited that these folks are helping us shape that thinking. So again, for those of you who have followed this initiative, this list of pilot communities is nothing new. These are the 11 pilot cities that have been working for the last year, uh, both locally and as a national cohort and as collaborators and thought partners to prepare for reopening as quickly and safely as possible. We are thrilled to announce that these communities are joining us as 2021 pilots, Anchorage, Alaska, Boise, Idaho, the Northwest Arkansas region, city of Pittsburgh, city of Sacramento, and the city of Tucson. Um, we'll be hopefully hearing from some of those folks today uh, in the program as well, but we've been doing our onboard meetings, welcoming, welcoming them to the program and, and to the initiative, and we just couldn't be more excited to connect the work and thinking that's been happening for the last year in our original pilots with these uh, additional cities. So what are we doing? Really, it, it, it kind of gets in these three buckets that we've talked about. Again, you know, the first is this engagement with and, and response to our local, state, and regional health protocols. Who's making these decisions? What are the decisions? What's the timeline? What's what? What are, what are the obligations of venues or festivals? Um, who? Uh, what information is is being used to make these decisions about what these protocols look like? So again, it's not just um, you know being in the Rolodex and getting advanced word. It's really trying to help inform those uh, regional health leaders as they are making these decisions. The second is really being uh, mindful about what does it look like to have meaningful community engagement with our stakeholder groups? How do we think about stakeholder groups? How are we talking to government? How are we talking with musicians and music workers and venue employees and then audiences? Because we know that reopening is gonna be hard. This is one of the hardest things that we've ever tried to do. I mean, it was really hard. It has been incredibly hard to shut down um, it's going to be hard to reopen. Our, our, our music ecosystems were vulnerable to begin with, and we can't take for granted that audiences are just going to come flocking back in at a level that we need for the, for the economics of the sector to work. So that gets that third bucket, which are these communications and outreach strategies, targeted messaging, developing assets, using public relations experts, thinking about paid and social media. I'm going to talk in more detail about that in a minute. But this is basically what our pilots have been thinking about for the last year. How do we do this work? And how do we prepare for what is now coming, which is the actual reopening process? So in terms of kind of looking under the hood of REVs, you, this work is, is really scalable. And part of our job over the next um, you know, month or so is, is really you know, sort of putting some parameters around what we can execute as a leadership group and as a, as a nonprofit. You know, so again, tier one is the work that we've been doing for a year in terms of managing our cohort, promoting. Uh, ideas through this program, bridging communities, things like that. Um, we are going to look to build some resources and, and, and try to increase our capacity to do more things we'd like to do. We would like to be doing more webinars and outreach efforts to different networks that are not deeply embedded in this work, but would benefit from understanding what we're up to. Some of that is talking to other arts disciplines. Some of that is talking to, again, uh, networks of regional arts organizations or conference of mayors, things like that. We would love to have a help desk. We would love to have a staff on board um, who can just be a resource for people who are not part of our REVS initiative but need to do this work. And then um, what we'd love to do, and I'm not sure we're gonna be able to do, but we'd love to do is really professionalize our audience engagement campaign. Because again, programs like this are really meaningful for us and, and they're great and uh, we really enjoy them, but we know the limitation of punk rock. And if you really believe in what you're doing, um, you've got to kind of put resources in, and, and a little bit of a, a little bit more intention around how are you hitting audiences? What are you saying to them? So, you know, we're looking to see what that could look like um, in a couple of different scenarios. So finally, I wanna drill down more uh, quickly at the end uh, before we bring in our guests and talk about what are these communication strategies that we're, we're talking about? Because we've talked in concept for a year about the need to do this effective outreach to audiences and our other stakeholders what does that really mean? And, and how do we put shape to that? So what we would like to do this year, and, and I think we're gonna see from a number of our pilots, are case studies and models about different tools and different tactics that we can and should be deploying to try to effectively reach these audiences. And just as a thought experiment, we can put them into these four buckets. Again, this is not the way the world works. These things all interconnect, so they can't really silo them. But 
But a way to think about it is, you know, digital marketing. So again, in our communities, our venues know who buys tickets to shows. They know who the audience is. They have their email addresses. What are we sending them? What are our messages? How do we frame it? How do, what does it look like? What is the ask that we're asking them to do? Um, how does that connect in with our web resources and our social media strategies? So, so we're looking for um, some of our pilots to put some resources and, and if we can help raise money, we'll put some resources into digital marketing strategies to kind of be, you know, provide examples of, of different models of doing this. We talk a lot about paid and earned media and working with uh, professional public relations experts and publicists that know how to get attention in a local market, get interviews placed, get articles placed, op-eds, public service announcements, using the tools of mass media to reach these audiences. A third uh, kind of bucket that we talk about are video assets. Um, how do we replicate the experience that audiences, musicians, and, and, and music workers are gonna have to go into venues for the first time? How are the venues oriented? What, what, what do the pods look like? What is security gonna look like? Like how can we make this more real for audiences so they can actually see it and don't just have to go sight unseen into what is for many is gonna be a very unsettling and potentially kind of traumatic experience to be going back into venues for the first time in a long time. And the fourth kind of bucket uh, is print campaigns and, and really playing into um, the tremendous resources of visual artists in our pilot cities to think about, is there a way to, to create or, or to, to commission some original work that could be posters, t-shirts, print ads, mobile ads, outdoor, to kind of reinforce the spirit of what does it mean to come back uh, to music and, and do this together in a way that, that we really are excited about and celebrate. So, so that's kind of the, the range of stuff that we're, we're doing, kind of a brief introduction. And Curtis, if, if you could turn on your camera and, and say hi, um, let's start with you. Uh, we are so thrilled that you're joining us from Houston, Texas as part of um, our leadership team and, and appreciate the work that you and Sean and so many others are doing with Neva. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, your kind of what's happening with your role in Neva and kind of the organizing that you're doing and how that may be intersecting with the work we've been doing locally through the REDS project? Hi, Michael. Uh, thanks for having me uh, on this and thanks for including us uh, with, uh, with REDS. We appreciate it. Um, my name is Curtis Monroe. I run a music venue down in Houston, Texas, and I'm also a co-chair of the NEVA uh, Reopening Task Force. Um, myself and Sean are very glad to be here and we're happy working with you guys uh, because we think there's a lot of synergy between the two groups uh, for certain. Uh, I think we can definitely work well together in getting the word on how to reopen safely. Yeah, and I think something we all talk about a lot in design of these programs is that we, we can't, we're, we can't reinvent the wheel, right? I mean, the point here is alignment and figuring out where we have different pieces of expertise in place and different networks that can be activated because if we're all duplicating work, we, we, we're not big enough. Like we just can't, we literally can't do that. So we've been really excited that organically Neva's organizing, you know, sort of took off at the same time that Res was taking off. And so very organically, Neva leaders are deeply embedded in each of our pilots, um, which has been great to see. But we're really excited, Curtis, again, as, as you guys are doing the broader base for the mobilization and education and developing guidelines and just kind of being a traffic cop, you know, that we're able to help figure out what does it look like, again, for our stuff, our work to either amplify that or help inform that or whatever that looks like. Correct. Yeah. I mean, right now we're, we're, we're putting together an opening checklist. Uh, we're working with a couple other different orgs on this. Um, we're hoping to have some consistency between a bunch of different groups. So we can hand out a piece of a great piece of work that everybody can use to apply to reopening. Uh, we're also hoping to get this blessed by the, the Centers for Disease Control. Yeah, that's going to be um, really soon. Yeah, yeah, and that that's going to be. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about about CDC with Dina Morris in a few minutes, but certainly the um, how do I say this the ability to work on the assumption that the Centers for Disease Control and the federal government is working in good faith and trying to figure out how to do this right is a, um, is a real blessing. And it's really important that they feel like they're being resourced by experts in the field who really know how this stuff works. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I know that's all a moving target because the government is just being staffed as we speak. And um, 
you know, so things are, are happening really quickly, but but that's good. So, well, Curtis, I know you've got to jump. We're just so happy again that you and, and Sean are taking this leap to help us uh, visualize and build out the Rev's work. And and um, and we're just thrilled to have you. And, and so thanks. Yeah, we're excited um, for sure. And uh, everybody have a great weekend. Um, get out and enjoy some sunshine. There you go. Thanks, Curtis. And Cole, if you don't mind turning on your camera and saying hi to us. Um, and while Cole's getting uh, getting ready, I, I do want to put a call out again. Um, we have a ton of, hey there, Cole. We have a ton of Revs people in the audience. Again, if you would like to join our kind of town hall session section of this program to share your experiences working in a Revs pilot or, or your questions or your concerns or your thoughts, either as a, as a 2020 pilot or someone who's new to the community, just use the raise hand function and, and Alex will bring you into the chat as, or into the conversation as we, uh, as we go through the hour. Um, or you can just put questions or comments in the chat as, as well, that is also fine. But Cole, it's great to see you. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, Always good to see you, Michael. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I said at the front, we're, we're so happy that you have agreed to serve on our leadership team. Um, you've been a key driver in the New Orleans Revs pilot. Um, it's important for us to have the uh, additional perspective of professional musicians and performers um, because obviously the issues around reopening um, are just so complicated as they relate to both public, excuse me, both health and economics and emotional welfare. And we also have so much appreciation for your work as a community organizer and activist and understanding that there are a lot of a lot of people that are not necessarily at the front of the line in these conversations. Um, so could you talk a little bit about what you've been doing in New Orleans and sort of what reopening feels like for you? I know your city is going through a complicated time right now. It always is, but it feels like a particularly complicated time. It's, it's complicated, but I think it's hopeful. You know, I think it's hopeful that we've been um, seeing some venues starting to reopen, doing it in a safe way. Um, it's, it's felt staggered. I really think that during this entire time, we've seen what happens when uh, we all work together. I've seen musicians have porch concerts. I've seen musicians and venues partner for outdoor um, sidewalk concerts. So I really think that there's a deep understanding about um, the particular place that the venue and the musician play in this infrastructure and this cultural community. So, you know, I, I, I'm from the church and in the church we're told that um, it's not just the building that makes the church, but it's the people congregating to, together that makes the church. So I think the same thing with live music, it's not just about the venue, it's not even just the musician, it's not even just the fans, but it's how all of these different pieces are moving together. So I feel like um, the awareness that I think musicians, music venues, and really importantly, the fans have of what goes into making a performance happen and what goes into making it happen safely. So I think the investment is there, just people need direction. Mm -hmm. Some people are vaccinated, some people are not. Some people wanna get vaccinated right now. Some people are skeptical. Um, we don't want to uh, uh, take away anybody's right to have live music but also we wanna make sure that we're practicing what are the best safety and health practices for a venue right now. So I think everybody's just using discernment. Um, I know the Musicians Clinic has been very involved in creating a space where um, musicians needs can be had, but also um, thinking about what music venues need and sort of like being that go-between for, um, for that and the culture bearers. So I think there are a lot of people working towards the same goal, which is reopen every music venue safely and let's value every piece that goes into making that happen. And that's so well said. And, and, you know, something, again, we, we talk about often, you know, in this program is just as, as a reminder to ourselves, like we don't, music policy forum does not exist because of the pandemic music policy forum exists because again, there are massive structural concerns about how do we all collectively understand this work and do it better. And, Music Policy Forum doesn't exist if it isn't for Ashley Keaton and the Ella Project and all of the sort of network of collaborators who have, have been thinking about this. New Orleans is such a fascinating case study of a community that relies so deeply on its culture bearers as an economic engine in ways that 
are oftentimes counterproductive for the livelihood of the culture bearers. I mean, you know, it, 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 you see the, you know, the Super Bowl commercials have come visit, you know, New Orleans, come see the real New Orleans, and then everybody flies down to their Airbnb and, you know, messes up the housing market. And then the culture bearers are like moving out to Metairie or something. I mean, it's, it's a really, really, yeah. And, you know, the, you know, I think about the musicians that were on the front line this entire time, the buskers, there were musicians that were in the quarter that were performing all the time, putting themselves at risk. So, you know, I'm working for the poor and with the poor people right now, the in-house community. And I just think about if we're going to rebuild, we always got to look at the bottom at the least of every community. And so what, how are we taking care of those musicians that are part of that cultural community? Yeah. And, and I think that, is, is again the point because we, and, and I'm guilty of this, um, but you know, the, this, this, this country has a, has a tendency to look at everything through sort of an economic or a capitalist lens. And again, you talk about New Orleans culture and it's often and fundamentally non-commercial. And it's not that people would not be interested in thinking about how to monetize their art or their culture, but you know, this is what they do. This is what they've done for generations. And it doesn't fit squarely into, again, the way we tend to value a lot of things in this country. And so we're really, you know, I think in the early days of trying to think about what that fundamental realignment, you know, means. And, you know, we, we've been heartened that there's been a lot of conversations about part of what, you know, not that there's any upside to the COVID shutdown, but it has forced us to reflect on some things in different ways and not take some things for granted. And, and that's going to be fascinating to see how music is kind of how we think differently about music and culture coming out of this in terms of, of, of these kind of broken structures. Yes. You know, to uh, touch on what you said about um, us putting money in capitalism first, I think we as a uh, community, as a nation, would be quite surprised what happens when we put people first. I think about Mardi Gras this year and we just adjusted. I mean, we just adjusted to um, having a porch, you know, porch floats which is something I don't think anyone thought of before, but it's like, why didn't we think about this before? So that happened quite seamlessly. I know our group down here was um, working on getting some videos done of black masking Indians and just the community, the neighborhood, what, what, what carnival and what Mardi Gras means in the neighborhoods in New Orleans. So I think that when we win, you know, each individual wins. And I think that if we put that, and we've seen that happening right now, so I think more of that, more of us working together. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Cole, we're just, again, we, we know you have so much on your plate and we are so appreciative that you're willing to join our national leadership team and, and again, help us get this, you know, kind of vision and strategy aligned with, with what we hope to execute. And, and so we just really, we value you and appreciate you. And thank you as always for, for joining us. It's my pleasure to be a voice for the people. That's that's why we're doing this. Thank you. Well, great to see you. And Dina Morris, do you mind turning your camera on, please? There she is. Hey, Dina. Hey. So um, before we get into our little conversation, again, a reminder, if anybody in, in who's watching uh, would like to join the conversation on camera, and share either your experience or your concerns or your hopes for the year or any anecdotes about what being part of Revs has been for you. Again, this is our kind of our one program where we're really doing the big picture kind of exploration of what this whole thing means and and uh, and what it means uh, for people who have not been able to be part of this for the last year. Um, so don't be shy, raise your hand and Alice can start kind of queuing people up who would like to uh, you, you know make statements or, or talk about stuff. And if everybody's shy, we will end early and we'll go watch March Madness. So Dina, you, um, as I said before, um, come to us with um, a couple of, you know, really awesome competencies, you know, as a public health expert, as somebody who's been deeply embedded in government service for, for many years. And now as the person who's been able to, you know, kind of help um, co-lead uh, the King County Revs pilot why don't we start there? Because we have a lot of folks participating today who have, you know, this is the first time they've been in, a, you know, kind of hearing about REVs, thinking about REVs. They're trying to think about how they organize their cohort. It was interesting in, in Seattle that the fact that you were coming into it as a music fan and appreciator and, you know, sort of like the first person to always be at the rock show 
but not somebody who sort of was like, quote unquote, in the community or like had a lot of like, you weren't hardwired in, gave you kind of, I think, an interesting perspective that might be helpful to share. Can you talk a little bit about what it's been for you to kind of co-lead um, you know, this, this pilot and also how the Seattle pilot has been organized in terms of who has been at the table. What does that look like? Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to. Thank you for asking. Um, I want to start by repeating something that Cole said, because I think, wow, I mean, it, it's just so helpful to reset the vision. Um, you know, it is like the church, you know, we, we talk a lot about the venue. We talk about the musicians, we talk about the venue workers, we talk about the patrons who are coming in. Um, but Cole reminded us that it's, it's, it's really the alchemy of what happens when we're all together in one place. Like that's what we're fighting for. You know, that's what we want back. Um, so thank you for saying that. Um, it's really helpful. Yeah. You know, um, I do come to this more from my love of music and then just kind of hope that maybe my policy background will be helpful somewhere. Um, and one, one of the things that's been really wonderful about the, the process of organizing a pilot here in King County in Seattle is that I think we've been able to establish relationships that either were very um, uh, thin or, or didn't exist at all. Um, and one of the things that I've, I've heard people say um, that I, I think is of great value is that in an environment where we might have once thought of ourselves as being competitors, we're now recognizing that we're all together um, and that there, there's a collaboration here um, and that uh, there's strength in working as a community rather than as competing with each other. Um, the other thing that I always like to say, because, you know, I spent so many years in Washington, D.C., where we treat information as a, a shield or a weapon. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about this part of the country and, and this really active venue community here is that people have been very forthcoming about their experiences, about their vulnerabilities, about the weak spots, about what's not working. Um, and also sharing things that are working so that other people can use that to adopt it. Um, so that's been a, a, a really, um, to me, surprising, but also really beautiful thing to see. And I think it's been part of the value of the, how many months have we been at this, nine months we've been at this, is that um, information really is flowing and it's helping all of the venues that are participating um, manage this difficult time more readily, more easily. Um, you also asked about who's at the table. And I think that's shifted a little bit, you know, initially, um, we had uh, representatives of uh, a musician's um, union. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a label that's shown up from time to time. We have um, an agent who's shown up from time to time, a couple of talent buyers, um, but primarily it's venue owners. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really been our steady, um, reliable group of people because I think there is this sense that it's, again, we're in it together. Yeah. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, well, actually, before we let's let's stay on this real quick, and we'll switch gears. But um, just could you talk a little bit about the um, actual structure of, of how you all have been meeting as a cohort? Um, because it's been really interesting to watch how that's worked and who are the kind of not only local voices, but what is it meant to bring in some outside perspectives to help sort of complement and amplify some of the local conversations. Yeah, that's a great question. I hope I can do it justice because it's a really good question. Um, we started by convening a weekly meeting. So in 2020, we met weekly at the same time each week. Um, and that's been really helpful because I think people can just build it into their calendar and we don't have to try and schedule every time. We began by listening. Um, what are people hearing? What are people feeling? What are you worrying about? What are you hopeful for? And then we started... Um, uh, it, it's all, it's almost, um, I'm not quite sure what the word is to use here, but it's almost like a coincidence or serendipity um, that we've been able to then pull in speakers who have addressed some of what we've been hearing. So um, throughout the course of 2020, oh my goodness, we must have had eight or 10 um, guest speakers who come in and, and they talk to us about everything from uh, potential liability as a venue owner um, to 
we had, of course, our local public health entity. That's one of the advantages of Seattle and King County is that we share a public health agency. Um, so our public health agency has participated in more than one meeting. Um, we've also had uh, people come in and talk to us about what is this, what does this um, look like in another uh, part of the world? Um, so Mark David from Music Venue Trust has been an invaluable um, guest who's come to share with us, like, here's what it looks like from where we stand in the UK. Um, we had the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which has been um, a key player in the, um, the modeling of what this disease looks like um, and had them come in and talk to us about kind of big picture, what to plan, what, what we might be able to plan for. Um, and, and then, you know, based on the interest that we get from our community, we then map out sort of what would be a, a helpful thing to have come in. And we've also taken a couple of deeper dives into some specific areas of concern um, with, that are not necessarily dependent on a guest speaker, but allow us to really focus on a given, um, on a given topic of concern. Yeah, and thank you, Dina. And it, it, this is such a, and, you know, such a trait thing to say, especially in a Zoom call, but it is remarkable to think about how Zoom it's really sort of, um, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 revolutionizing is really not too strong of a word. I mean, it's really reshaping the way that we can do not only these local organizing efforts, you know, the idea of trying to get 25 people in the same room every two weeks is just not going to happen, you know, and the idea of people popping onto a Zoom and then being able to, to sort of do what we've... <laughs> Mark O'Shea saying Zoom saved the day. I don't, <laughs> I hate to say that, but but Mark O'Shea, who is, is helping lead our, our Cleveland uh, regional cohort is a great example of someone who is able to participate in our Seattle meetings and, and get a sense of what's happening there and bring that information home. The kind of organizing stuff that'd be really hard to do on conference call and, and just impossible to do in person. So it's been really interesting on the fly to kind of think about the hyper-local into the regional, into the global kind of work that we've been able to do. And, and that was the hope of the REVS model from last year. And we've been really excited to see that, you know, some of the things that we hoped would happen, you know, are definitely happening. So, so that's, that's been great. Thank you for sharing that. Dina, you know, one last question, and then I'll, I'll let you get on um, to your March Madness, or whatever you're going to do today. But the, um, if you could just share a little bit, again, I, as we talked about, you have um, experience not only in the broader public health community, but specifically working at the Centers for Disease Control. And I know it's, it, 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 it's, it's been hard. Um, I think last year was particularly hard and I don't think we need to go into a political uh, rabbit hole conversation, you know, but if you could just speak a little bit about your sense of the professionals who work in that organization, the career people who have been at CDC and, and are at CDC and what should be our expectations um, for the, the kind of public health community across the board as we try to get over whatever this hump is gonna be that we're, we're all trying to solve together. Can you just reflect on that a little bit from your personal experience? Oh my gosh, there's so much to say. I mean, you, you said this earlier, Michael, that, and I can't remember the exact words you used, but it's, you know, to see the CDC um, be given free reign again, <laughs> and to know that they're actually, what, what they're working on is getting out into the public and that there's not this, you know, this political filter. Um, the, the people at the CDC, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, most of whom are based in Atlanta, but not all by any stretch, um, are, <laughs> they're all overqualified, has that for an answer. <laughs> um, they are scientists first and foremost, and they're there because they believe in public health. And public health has always been a little bit of an underdog because people would rather fund the National Institutes for Health to cure cancer, then they would fund the Centers for Disease Control that tells you what not to smoke and what not to drink and prevent cancer. Um, so it, I say all that to say the people who populate that center are there because they believe in public health because it's not a glamorous agency. Um, and it is often the underdog when it comes to the federal constellation of health agencies. Um, and everything there is data-based. You can't express an opinion without pointing to the data set that supports it. So there's a lot of reason to feel tremendous confidence in what CDC gives us. And I know that they got a little bit battered and bruised um, 
recently. And, and I think under the new leadership, um, people can, um, again, can bring that science-based um, information forward. And that's not to say, you guys, that there's never a mistake or that it's a perfect agency. Of course not. I mean, it's populated by humans. Um, but I think we can expect some honesty about, hey, we just learned something new and what was true last week is a little bit different this week. And I think we can expect that kind of uh, information to be forthcoming and to be um, science-based and science-driven. I appreciate that, Dean. And it, it kind of makes me think about, you know, so one of the old cliches we used to talk about in our advocacy work, you know, that, you know, elected officials by definition at some point are going to, going to disappoint you. I mean, you're going to be disappointed. And, and at some level that extends to, I would imagine, the scientists and others at CDC that everybody's doing the best they can do. And we can go into this with good faith and, and, and good intentions and, and hope that they can be collaborators and, and it may be disappointing. It may be hard. It may not be exactly what we'd like, but, you know, erring on the side of, of trying to be a resource, trying to be at the table, trying to help, you know, be in collaboration and dialogue is a heck of a lot better than standing in the corner and just waiting to see what they say or ignoring it. So um, it's going to be, going to be fascinating. And, and so, you know, again, we pull together, you know, kind of what's going to be happening at the CDC level. And again, big shout out to Neva and all the other organizations that are working um, you know, with them on, on reopening guidelines. Um, a big shout out again, the, the news we shared earlier today about the pro progress on the, um, on the, at the SBA front with the shuttered venue grant. Um, thank you to Rebecca Gates for the reminder in the chat that we've got PPP loans that are available until March 31st. I mean, just a lot, a lot, a lot going on that we need to tap into. And hopefully as we get into the spring, we're gonna be in very different um, public health dynamics and very different sort of economic dynamics. So it's gonna be really, really complicated uh, and exciting and exciting. Dean, and thank you for your leadership in Seattle. Thank you for joining our national leadership team. We're thrilled to have you. If you could stick around um, as we get questions, we may have some stuff we'd love you to chime in on. And Jesse Elliott's joined the Zoom and I'm very happy to, to ask Jesse to turn his camera on and say hi to us. Um, Jesse is of course a friend of many of us in uh, Music Policy Forum land and looks like he's in an airplane uh, restroom. Is that, looks like where you're, is that, are you flying somewhere? Are you off to South by Southwest or what, what's happening, Jesse? This is not my beautiful booth. This is a, uh, you know, one of those phone booth things they put in the, the workspace these days. Yeah, I know a lot of you already on the chat and, and dropping emails here and stuff from uh, my decade in Colorado doing music cities and music ecosystems work. Uh, some others of you from my decade on the road based in uh, amazing Washington, DC. And I would say, by the way, I highly encourage anyone considering raising their hand in this forum uh, to do it. It's the giddy adrenaline rush of being in the crowd for a great live show and then quietly slipping out the back exit, the alleyway, running around the side of the building where your friend is holding the side door to the green room open. And then you get to watch uh, someone amazing like Dina Morris or Cole Williams from side stage while you're getting nervous but thrilled about walking onto the virtual stage with Michael Bracy, what a what a show indeed, Bracy. Uh, so yeah, I'm in Northwest Arkansas now. Um, uh, not a lot of folks know where that is. It's in Arkansas. Not surprisingly, it's in the northwest corner of Arkansas. Um, it is a region that borders Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri. Uh, our friends in Louisiana to the south and Mississippi to the east. It is technically. Uh, a part of the South, although a lot of us describe it in different ways as, you know, it's the Southeast or it's the Northwest of the Southeast or the uh, Southern border of the Midwest or, uh, or sort of the Eastern border of the, of the Plains and the Oklahoma lands. Um, I encourage you all to come visit. It's, it's smack dab in the middle. Uh, one of the things I'm most excited about this group uh, for is that we are in this ideal location for when the world does reopen safely. We have Tulsa and Oklahoma City and Kansas City and Memphis and St. Louis and New Orleans, all these great American music cities on every side of us. And we're smack dab in the middle of them. Um, and so we're excited to open up some of those touring routes. Um, there are uh, people like Brian Crown on the call, a uh, longtime owner operator of George's Majestic in Fayetteville, Arkansas. If you have known or played Arkansas, you have probably played at George's at some point. Um, Brian also books the Arkansas Music Pavilion or the AMP, uh, which is a much larger uh, outdoor amphitheater. Um, and we're just really excited to join the cohort this year. Um, 
psyched that Alaska is on the call. We have a lot of ideas to exchange. I would, I would put out there that in general, as those of you who know me know, I'm always a fan of the sort of off the beaten places just a little bit. And I think um, those places are actually really important to our broader music ecosystems, especially to the touring <clears throat> ecosystem, and especially in figuring out ways that uh, musicians and uh, audiences can connect in places that are sort of between the megalopolis zones. And so Northwest Arkansas is making a serious push. Uh, it's already sort of a globally recognized center of art uh, because of uh, Crystal Bridges, uh, the museum, and now the Momentary, which is Crystal Bridges sort of younger, hipper, more experimental uh, art sister. Um, and it's already a, a sort of globally known capital of mountain biking. Uh, we have the Ozark Mountains here. It is the natural state. It used to be the west coast of the United States. So it's, uh, I, I tell most of my friends that it's the Colorado of the, of the Mid-South, and they know exactly what I mean. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say hi. I'm excited for Boise to be on the call. Part of me wants to force Eric Gilbert into the raising hand, running around the side of the building zone. Um, part of me wants to force Brian Crown to do that. These are such hum humble people that they would probably uh, never jump at that chance in the same way that I would. So um, well, just say hi on behalf of everyone. And, and yeah, Gracie, back to you. No, Jesse, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And, and we're so excited um, to have Northwest Arkansas. We're excited about the regional aspect that we are looking at multi-cities. Um, you know, a big part of this conversation that we're just starting to get our head around is the distinction between um, local artists playing local venues and then getting touring routes going and playing multiple cities and, and all the uncertainty about, um, you know, how these protocols are going to translate across markets. You know, we've been talking a lot about, again, yep. the Canadian Music Corridor that has been, been uh, worked on for years in terms of Portland and Seattle and Boise and Anchorage and even Vancouver, BC. And so we're looking at sort of some potential collaborations among venues in those cities. Um, similar with, with Pittsburgh joining the cohort, um, Pittsburgh and Cleveland, and, and thinking about our regional partners in, in Ohio. So there are a lot of tentacles to this and, and uh, we're just thrilled that, that you guys in Northwest Arkansas are, are joining and we can't wait to get to meet and know much more about you. And Scotty Halter has been designated to uh, organize the rest tour for 2023. So when, when we're all ready to hit the road and visit all these cities in person, Scotty said he's going to take care of getting the bus and, and getting this all figured out. So we I'll will to, we'll uh, roll out the, uh, roll out the red state carpet for you. There you go. There you go. Everybody wants to swap uh, ideas about how these kinds of things function in reddish or purplish states. Uh, that's a particular passion of mine as well. So um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that for now. We actually, this is a, a great question in the chat from, from Delug, which actually dovetails, I think, with some of what Sam wanted to talk about. So Sam, Gogan, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us from Colorado. It's great to see you as always. Mr. Merrick, I just, yeah, how are things? Hi, guys. Yeah. Hi, Michael. It's great to be here. Jesse, wonderful to see you. You too. Uh, yeah. Too. Long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. Thank you for letting me get on camera. And yeah, uh, Michael, I sent you this question. You know, I'm in a very small rural area and I wanna know, and for anybody else who's here, how do these small communities, because we are getting back to doing some shows. I, my band is gonna be doing a show at a new hostel that has opened up, that has room and they can do limited capacity because uh, our county, is considered on the blue dial in the state of Colorado that we can, I think, go up to 80% capacity indoors now. So how can these rural communities that I have a feeling we're gonna see these types of places open up before we see major things happening in cities. And these can be our litmus tests. Uh, how do we keep track of the people over here? Are we transmitting? Are we following the guidelines properly enough to know and how to help out perhaps the cities. You know, that's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna kind of take that as almost a rhetorical question because I don't feel like I have a, a particularly good answer to that. Um, I, I do think, uh, again, when we talk about the network design of REVs, it's meant to you know hopefully create opportunities where Sam, you can be talking to people in Jesse's network and maybe talking to people, maybe, you know, the Boise contingent may have some, some rural partners, certainly Sean 
Lynch being part of our national leadership team out of uh, Montana. You know, so hopefully we, we can be um, helping stand up some of these um, really important conversations because, again, you know, the, the, the underlying concept of REVs is that none of us know any of this, right? I mean, we're all making this up as we go along and it's, it's all sort of not a top down. We come up with the answers that we tell everybody what to do. It's more how do we leverage these networks to say, oh, that's really interesting. We haven't thought about that. You know, I know, you know, John Christensen and the Alaska folks are doing a lot of work, not only in Anchorage, we're doing a lot of statewide work across Alaska. So there may be some learnings there. And that would be, you know, sort of the subgroup that would be very happy to help, um, you know, facilitate or again stand up if if there's interest in that. So, I think yeah. And and so Michael, fun. can I just throw out because I think I'm somehow accidentally still on awkwardly on stage here that I, I think Sam's exactly right, which is that you know Arkansas actually sort of made the papers, made the New York Times, uh, if any of you remember last summer for being one of the first to to open and. Well, I think a lot of people read that politically and, and, and via state guidelines, et cetera, which I think is right. I think that's half of the reason for it. But I think the other half, which is more interesting for this crew, is sort of the practical aspect of putting on shows in more rural settings, which are by their practical logistical nature, already more spaced out. Like we've already built more outdoor st stages. The venues are already, they already have their own parking lots and beer gardens and da da da. And I think because of that, it does offer sort of a lower risk. Like there's a genuine lower risk to living in a place that's more rural right now, which is part of the big divide that gets translated politically on most levels. But I think part of that is just because like, it's kind of easier to get around and do stuff. And actually people in, that I've experienced, so I've been doing a triangle between Colorado, Minnesota and Arkansas for the last year driving one day at a time. And, and I've actually found that there's not many places where people aren't, wearing masks or keeping a 10 foot or a six foot or whatever distance, it's just kind of easier to do it. Um, so I would just throw out that, again, like Sam said, use us as something of a guinea pig, uh, but let's do it safely, of course. We all want that. Yeah. So I'm gonna Thanks, Jesse. take a couple questions um, that are in the chat, um, great questions. So uh, Rebecca's asking, are we gonna be kind of doing a gig report um, database. Um, that is part, uh, Rebecca, when I was kind of laying through the sort of tiers that we're, we're, just, we're trying to sort out in terms of what capacity do we have. Um, and that's something that we're going to figure out. Those are the type of resources we would be thrilled to be able to organize and, and share or amplify others if others are doing that work, just sort of put a spotlight on it. But that is the kind of thing that we absolutely need. We need, you know, case studies and and all the rest of that stuff. And Rebecca, as always, I'd love to talk to you offline if you have specific thoughts about what the what that could look like. Um, so I think with that, I think we're I I, I think we're going to kind of wrap this. I think we're almost at time. So um, again, I want to thank uh, everybody who's uh, watched today, participated today, has been part of a Rev's initiative, as part of the new Rev's pilot. Um, and especially people who, again, this is a new conversation for, who feel the need to do this work but have not had a chance to tap into it yet. We're really um, excited about this year. Um, we are hopeful that we can you know, do the best that we can do and our community can do to kind of share these resources and information and, and do this as well as we can hope to do together. Um, in terms of intersecting with our work moving forward, you can always reach us at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Um, if you are in a community or are thinking of a community that should be part of this initiative as a pilot, um, we could probably accept three or four more cities if we move quickly. I've been, you know, all, a lot of us have been talking to a bunch of cities and it's not the right fit for everybody for a lot of really good reasons and that doesn't hurt our feelings. And we're not looking necessarily, we don't need to have more pilots. We're good with the number that we have. But if you are living in a city uh, or in a region that you think should benefit from this work, um, feel free to email us and, and we can have a conversation about what that could look like. Um, the, uh, in terms of our programming, so um, again, we're gonna be back every Friday for the foreseeable future with Music Policy Forum Live. If you have ideas or suggestions or recommendations for topics, um, please again, feel free to email us at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Um, if you have constructive criticism and you want to word it very kindly, we will also appreciate that. We uh, do this program 
because people get a lot out of it and they give us really uh, supportive feedback. So if, if there's stuff that we can be doing differently or better, always love to hear it. Um, and with that, I think we're gonna thank everybody. Alex Dolvin, again, great job um, managing our, the production side of the house. Thank you to our guests. Thank you to Shannon Wells and the great people of Seattle for all the work that you do. And we will see you next Friday. Um, go Hoyas. Okay, bye everybody.